I have a very special guest in camp. I do. Uh, you know, it's something, Charlie, I know, and, and you've watched our videos, and we pay tribute to it at the end of every video, and that is the servicemen and women and veterans. And as, as we get honored, uh, get ready to honor Veterans Day, and I always tell people when it comes around to Veterans Day, it shouldn't be November 11th. It should be every day, every year, all the time, because uh, so many gave a sacrifice for us to have that freedom. And it is such an honor to have you in a camp. And I know you've been in some really bad camps, Charlie, but I hope this is a better camp. I do, my friend. Uh, so just tell me, where are you from, Charlie? I know you told me later today, Kansas. I so you know, Kansas. Kansas and Okies, we're Absolutely. pretty good people. Yeah, you yeah, know you what we are. Kind of like, a, kind of like a, and one of those little areas to the south of us. Yes. Uh, worked yeah. out pretty well. Yeah. Y'all let the wind blow through there quite often. Yeah, we do. Yeah. yeah what part do. of Kansas? Well, uh, near Topeka, a little town called Lee Compton. All right. Kansas, 325 yeah. souls. Yeah. And a couple of Presbyterians. <laughs> <laughs> so, would you just tell us, Charlie, name, where you're from? What's happening? Sure, sure. Charlie Plum. I grew up in Kansas, uh, age 17. I'd never seen the ocean, never ridden an airplane. Never been out of the four states of Kansas, Oklahoma, Missouri, and Nebraska. Uh, and I joined the Navy. Yeah. <laughs> Got to see a whole lot more after that, I didn't did, you? I'd see a lot more. So I went to the Naval Academy, went through flight training, flew uh, jet fighters in Vietnam, uh, 74 successful combat missions, shot down on my 75th with five days from the end of my tour of duty. Spent the next 2,103 days in prison camps in North Vietnam. Well, it is, it is an honor to, to have you here. It is. And, and you told me earlier there was 500 and how many of you? In 591 that? came home. Mm -hmm. I know. That is, a, that is a remarkable bunch of people to stick together through that. You know, it really is. And uh, when, we, when, we, when I think about Veterans Day, I think about what they give. You know, and I know you've, you've, you've given a lot. But you've also, you have forgiven you know, and that is a big part of it to me. It really was, and part of my survival, I think, was what my mother taught me about forgiving yeah. and uh, early in life. And it turned out to be a great Christian principle, of course, but it's also a survival principle. And I, I remember those first several months in that little eight foot by eight foot prison cell that I was in, I was feeling sorry for myself and blaming everybody else and had all of this hate built up in, against the enemy. The guards would come in. I remember one time this, this guard couldn't have been 13, 14 years old. He wanted to impress his girlfriend. So he came in with his bayonet and his big boots and he started stomping on me and hitting me with his bayonet. And his girlfriend was back there laughing at him and he thought that was a big deal. And I got so mad at this guy. I wanted to wring his neck. And a few days later, we had this secret code. We'd pass on, uh, uh, tap on the walls or pass a wire through a hole and contact another guy. And, and so in, in our communication, we would pass around Bible verses and patriotic quotes and, and poetry of all types. And this one guy passed me this, this quote, and, um, and it meant a lot to me. And the quote was this, acid does more harm on the vessel it's stored than on the subject it's poured. Uh, so Mark Twain, and, and, and I thought to myself, if I, if I keep all this bitterness within me, all this vitriol within me, I'm not hurting the enemy. I'm not a very good soldier if I'm, I'm killing myself. Yeah. And, and, and I kind of made a commitment at that moment in my life. I said, if I die here, they got to work on me. You know, I'm not going to do it myself. Yeah. It's not going to make it easy for them. Uh, and so from that day forward, you know, I kept thinking about my mom and the Bible verses she taught me about forgiveness, and, and it really works. You know, it's a, it's a great liberating feeling, you know, when you can f forgive not just the people that harmed you, but forgive yourself. Yeah. So yeah. it works. And uh, how, how many days again, Charlie? <laughs> 2,103. 2,103. Uh, and I know they were probably all hard days, but I'm sure the first part of that might have been worse than the last, true? Oh, by far. Yeah, the first few months and, and year were really by far the worst part. Yeah. 
It's like anything else, Kent. Once you get used to something a day at a time and you get a routine going and things to think about, and things to do, um, it, it just gets easier and easier. And so, uh, yeah, you know, by the, by the end of the war, it was just vacation. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I thought of it as vacation, Charlie. I don't, I don't know. You don't have room service there? Yeah. You had two, two bowls of rice every yeah. day? Gourmet meals, right? <laughs> you were that. Uh, you, you was telling us earlier about you know, what you got to eat, you know, and, and most every day was just rice. Yeah, yeah, and that was our, our, was our staple, two bowls of rice a day, and sometimes they'd give you a little broth, yeah. and, uh, and so that was it. Uh, once a year we got a banana. That was a big deal. Uh, I bet it was. <laughs> uh, and you spent some of that time in solitary confinement, I did. didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I did. Now, I, I was a very junior guy. I was 24 when I was shot down. And so the senior guys had a lot more uh, problems. And, and one of our senior guys was in solitary for four and a half years. Mm. I'm sure it's, it's difficult for anybody to understand how you can forgive such a, such a tragedy, you know, such a, such a pain as being tortured uh, and, and, and being uh, slapped around and kicked and, and you're just treated like scum of the earth. Uh, and, uh, you know, how, how do you recover from that? And, and I remember pacing in that, I had an eight foot by eight foot cell. I could pace three steps one direction, turn around and pace three steps the other way. And, uh, and I was pacing along, uh, being, being very embarrassed uh, and, uh, and very shameful. In the military, we have what we call the code of conduct. If you're a prisoner of war, the code of conduct says you are obliged to give only name, rank, serial number, date of birth. I flew the skies of Vietnam in that supersonic jet airplane, that F-4 Phantom, thinking I was tough enough. I was big enough. I was the top gun. I, I will never give more than name, rank, serial number, date of birth. I, and, and I was shot down, and, and the pain was too great, and I gave in. And I felt very guilty about that, you know, that I'd failed in my mission. I'm thinking, what will they say? What will my buddies, what will my family say when they, fi they find out that I, 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 they'd fail so miserably and that, I, that I'd given in, you know, I'd given up. Maybe if the war ever ends, I won't go home. I won't have to face people who will, who will condemn me for, for my failure. Maybe I'll go to some foreign country and change my name and live off the rest of my life and I'll never have to, to face this fact. And, and then, and so I'm pacing along in this cell and I uh, heard a cricket in the far corner of my prison cell. And I thought, uh, I'd been a farm kid, knew what a cricket sounded like. But the longer I listened, the more rhythmic the chirp became, and I walked over to check it out. And it wasn't a cricket, it was a little piece of wire, about that long, it was poked through a hole at the base of the cell wall and scratching on my concrete floor, making this chirping noise like a cricket. Well, I'm thinking to myself, the enemy is not sophisticated enough to try to trick me. It, it must be another American trying to, trying to communicate with me. If it's another American, it also has to be a fighter pilot, since that's who's in these prison camps. I'm thinking, boy, would I like to talk to another fighter pilot. We can tell some stories, and, but I bet he's tougher than I am. I bet he's older, probably more mature. He probably, he probably didn't spill his guts when they tortured him. He probably stuck with the name, rank, serial number, date of birth, and I didn't. I don't even want to talk to anybody who I have to compare myself to, because I'm sure he's stronger than I am. And, and, and the wire kept scratching on my floor, and I was afraid it was going to attract a guard, and we were all going to get in trouble. And so I finally went over, reached down, and I tugged on this wire, and it tugged back. And I tugged again, and the wire disappeared right back through that rat hole. Well, that wire came back about, about an hour later, and this time it had a note wrapped around the end of it. And the note was written on a dirty piece of toilet paper, just blobs, and it said, memorize this code, then eat this note. <laughs> well, I, I did it. I memorized the code, I ate the note, and I started tugging on the wire in certain numbers that would represent various letters of the alphabet, uh, and started communicating with this guy. Well, he'd been there for two years when I was shot down. So he was there for over eight years in that prison camp. He had spent a good long number of hours, weeks, months, piecing together little bits of wire, stuffing them out a hole in his cell wall, across a storeroom between our two prison cells, over the boxes, around the shovels, through the ropes, into the little hole in my cell wall, 14 feet away. 
just to communicate with me. Just, you know, just to, to bring me into this network that was so important in our survival. <laughs> and and he, his first words, how you doing, buddy? I said, I'm doing terrible, buddy. <laughs> I said, my president sent me over here. It's his dirty Vietnam War, not mine. And uh, I don't know, that airplane, the mechanic that put that airplane together, maybe he's the reason I failed. And it's not fair that they're torturing prisoners. And, and I didn't, it wasn't my private airplane I flew in. I'm giving him all these excuses, okay, as, as, why, as why I should feel the way I feel. <laughs> and he, he said, uh, you want to know your biggest problem? I said, you mean I have problems bigger than the ones I can see? He said, sounds like it. He said, you're suffering from a fairly common prison disease. Now, at that time, I was covered with boils. I was bleeding from four open wounds in my body, no medical care. I'm thinking, what more can, can this disease be? I thought, what's, what's the disease? He said, we don't know for sure. Around here, we call it prison thinking. I said, prison thinking? He said, Roger, you think you are a prisoner. I stepped back from that corner and a little self-analysis. I'm down to 120 pounds. I'm bleeding from four open wounds. I got boils all over my body. My sole possession in life is a rag I have knotted around my waist to hide my nudity. I'm rotting away in a communist prison camp and now to add insult to injury, they put me next to a positive thinker. <laughs> So I kept tugging. It was the only ball game in town. I said, okay. So this guy, Bob Shoemaker, still one of my best friends, taught me a lot. He said, man, he said, when a fighter pilot his first shot down, blown out of the sky, said, what's the first emotion? You start to blame everybody else for your problems. You start feeling sorry for yourself. You, you know, you go into this pity party of your own. He said, and you, you think that you have only no control of your destiny. He said, man, you still have total control of your destiny. It's not what's around you that makes a difference. It's your decisions about what's around you. That's what, that, that's the difference yeah. you make. He said, one time he said, you know, adversity is a horrible thing to waste. He said, within every challenge in life, there's some kind of an opportunity there. And if you can figure that out, make it a puzzle and, uh, and then I thought back to the Bible verse, Romans 8, 28. I thought, you know, all, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. Yep. And I'm, I'm thinking, that can't be true. This, this prison situation can come up with something for good. And all I have to do is love the Lord. That's easy for me. I'm going to check it out. Let's see if this Bible verse really works. <laughs> That's a test of faith. That's a, it is a test of faith. <laughs> and, it, and the good news is it works. Yeah. <laughs> You know, Charlie, I know you went through a lot, but whatever you feel most comfortable with, what, what were the hardest days, the hardest times, Charlie? Well, the torture was probably the hardest physical stuff that I did. It was an age old torture technique that they had been using for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, a system where they, they fold your body up into a human pretzel. It starts with a set of, of uh, leg irons with, a, with two U-shaped irons and they run a bar through that. Then they put your, your, your wrists in, uh, in cuffs behind your back. And this, this prison camp was built by the French to, to house the Vietnamese, very small people. And so our wrists were, very, were a lot larger than these manacles were and they tightened them down with like a skate key behind your back. And then they wrap your, your, your elbows together. They actually pull your elbows to, to, until they're touching. Then you run a rope from your shackles and your ankles over your shoulder and down to your wrists. And then they put a stick of bamboo in there and they start tightening this rope. The end result is your feet are right up in your face. I remember looking back over my head and seeing my wrists backwards. My shoulders, of course, were out of joint by this time. And I'm just all folded up like this human pretzel, human pretzel. And then if that's not enough, they take another rope and they, and they run through that first rope and, and tie you to a, a hook in the ceiling and they hoist you up on this hook for, for an hour or two. So is, the purpose of the torture wasn't to kill you. As a matter of fact, I, I kept wishing uh, that I would pass out, but you, you can't pass out. You just sit there and hurt. And I established what I called the 
plateaus of pain. And, uh, you know, I'd get wrapped up like this and it hurt really bad. I think, you know, I'm breathing, I'm still alive. If it doesn't get any worse than this, I'm going to survive. And then they tightened the rope and it got worse. And then I'd say, you know, it's, it, it, the pain is tougher now, but I'm still breathing. I'm still alive. If it doesn't get any worse than this, I'm going to live. And then it got worse. So I established these plateaus of pain. And eventually they, they loosened the, the ropes and let me lay there in my, in my blood uh, for the rest of the night. How long would this go on? Well, it, it actually lasted only two days. Uh, then they came back about every six months. So what they were doing from the beginning, they were, they were looking for uh, targets. Uh, they wanted to know what future targets yeah. so they could set their, their, their guns around the target. And so, and uh, I'm, I'm figuring, you know, I can't, well, first of all, I didn't know the targets. They didn't tell pilots what future targets were, only the ones we were on. And so the first time they asked me, ah, well, what the heck, I said, the next target to be hit by, by, by my air wing is going to be the Hanoi Brewery. <laughs> I said, uh, it's a psychological warfare. We're going to try to destroy the morale of their soldiers by cutting off your beer. <laughs> yeah. And I found out later from intelligence that they had actually gone out and had set their guns around their brewery uh, while my air wing hit their bridge. <laughs> So that wasn't enough. They came back the next time. And I found out they were believing me and telling me these wild, wild stories. They said, what base did you fly from? I said, well, I, well first of all, I knew they knew the answer. It had been written, you know, right on my back. Yeah. It said, USS Kitty Hawk aircraft carrier. And I thought that was pretty tricky. If the military tells you to give name, rank, serial number, date of birth, then they write your ship on your back. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. what's with it? So I, I knew they knew the answer. I think they're checking my answers now. I better shoot straight. I said, I flew from the aircraft carrier Kitty Hawk. Uh, that's a lie. They slapped me around and kicked me. And said, that's a lie. Tell us the truth. I'm telling you the truth. I, I flew from the aircraft carrier Kitty Hawk. It's out there in the Gulf of Tonkin. You know, take a look. No, we know, we know you could never have taken a big airplane like you flew in here off a boat. We know you, you need a runway that's at least a mile long. I said, well, maybe time for another fib. I said, we have a lot of ships out there in the Seventh Fleet. We just line them all up to we got a long <laughs> runway. Skip one the other. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and they believed it. They believed it, yeah. yeah. And what was really strange was, even after they had found out the truth about any of the lies that we told them, they were embarrassed to come back and admit that we'd, yeah. that we'd pulled the wool over their eyes. Yeah. It's, uh, it, was, it was a crazy thing, but yeah, we got, we got uh, by with lying to them a lot. <laughs> and I know you had to try to find some humor in there all the time, oh, you absolutely. know, to keep it up. And, uh, absolutely. In, I, in fact, you know, it's like anything in life. You, you, if you have a choice of crying about something or laughing about something, you know, it's a whole lot healthier to laugh about it. Yeah. And so we, you know, we told all kinds of jokes and, and, uh, and, and played tricks on each other and all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's something that I'm glad you get to pass on to to share with not only just me but everybody, you know what what y'all went through, but uh, you've got a big heart, Charlie. Yeah, uh, you really do. It's a it's a heart that's that's full of care, uh, full of love. But to forgive that much harm to a person, there's so much inner faith that has to come about. And I, I know when we was talking the other night. You, you was telling me something out of all them 500 and something that came home, and you asked me what was the percentage that had PTSD. Yeah. And, I, and I said 10%. And you said, well, you're close. It was 14. Four. It was four. Four. Four percent. I'm sorry. And I said, well, that came really, in my belief, from y'all's raising, from your morals, from your values, you know, that were instilled upon all them young men. Because how many people over there, Charlie, was with you that come from rural America? Was you know, a bunch. there was a bunch, and uh, and and you know, I found out that that they were the strongest bunch. You know, uh, guys that had grown up like I did. You know, on poor and and you know, kind of fighting our way. But I mean, we didn't know we were poor. Yeah. You know, and you grew up the same way. Uh, it's there's something about 
uh, you know, an ag background and, and kind of being out in, 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 in the wilderness like we're here now, that uh, you build character. Yeah. You know, I, I, I really believe in this kind of life and I'm really comfortable here. Yeah. But uh, and it, it, it seemed like that the guys that were more sophisticated, if you will, if you want to use that term, were the guys that broke uh, and, and the guys that, uh, that, that didn't make it and then couldn't make it. Yeah. So, To me, I always looked at it when troubled times come, uh, you could give in really easy, or you could just thinking, I've, I've got to perspire and persist. You know, uh, it was one of them things my dad taught me. But uh, I didn't go through what y'all went through, Charlie. And um, I don't, I don't know that I could have made it, but I'd want to think that I had the same mindset as you to where I'm gonna think, hey, it's a, it's a holiday, wasn't it? Can, can I, I guarantee you could have made it and we could have used some of your cooking in there too, I tell you. I, I don't serve much rice on the wagon, you <laughs> know what I mean? I don't serve much rice at all. Uh, but when you got close to knowing you were coming home, I mean, when did you really find out that, hey, I'm going to get out of here? You know, they tried to trick us a lot of times. They would come in and say, all you have to do is, is uh, confess, you know, that, you, that you, you bombed the the pagodas and you bombed the schools and the hospital you confess to that and we'll send you home well they were never going to send us home uh, they just wanted a confession out of us and so we were very very skeptical you know when they uh, uh you know sometimes you get an extra bowl of rice you know oh, we're going home they're trying to fatten us up well it didn't work uh so the first thing that that i that that i knew that i kind of figured we're going home is they they brought in a, a piece of toilet paper and they put it on the floor and said, so put your bare foot on here. And they, they put, took a pencil and they, they drew around the toilet paper. They're gonna make some shoes, you know? Now we hadn't seen a pair of shoes in six years. Yeah. And so they're gonna, they're gonna make some shoes. And uh, so the rumor was out, we we're gonna go home. And then they allowed us outside uh, some of the time to get some color, you know? Yeah. They, they didn't want people to think that, you know, that we'd, that we'd been uh, in a prison forever, that, and so they started feeding us better food the uh, last month, month that we were there. So we knew something was up. And uh, so then he brought in a pair of trousers with a real zipper. Hadn't seen a zipper in six years. Ran that zipper up and down. I was so proud. <laughs> <laughs> and you had shoes. Had shoes. Yeah, we had shoes. Yeah. <laughs> That's Sunday go to meeting clothes right oh, there, yeah. Charlie. We, we were ready to go. Yeah. We ready to go. Uh, when, you, when you got back to the States, um, I know there was probably a lot of things that were going through your mind, but what's the first thing Charlie Plum wanted to do? You know, it's kind of interesting because uh, this flying stuff kind of gets in your blood. Well, when I came home, they, they thought I'd be crazy. You know, after that kind of an experience, a guy can't possibly be normal after something like that. And so the first guy that I met at Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines, uh, when, I, when I flew out of there, was a psychiatrist. And he said, um, and, and he told me that my wife had filed for divorce just three months before I came home. And he said, uh, how do you feel about that? I said, well, I'm, I'm sad, you know, I'm disappointed, but hey man, I'm free. I got a lot of things going on here. He said, well, he said, now, from what you've been through, and now you know this, uh, that your wife has divorced you, you really need to get angry. You really need to get bitter. He said, you have the right to be bitter. I said, Doc, I have the right to have diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> but I choose not to be bitter. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I came home and I was in the hospital for a while, and uh, and and then I started living my life and married a wonderful gal, and we have four kids and four grandkids, and I live the life of life of Riley. When you when you hear the word veteran, Charlie, what's it mean to you? I'm glad you asked that because this whole program is not about me or even you. It's yeah. about these uh, guys and gals that have served their country. Yeah. And I got to thinking about your audience and in, in, in the people that are, that are watching you, uh, a lot of them were veterans, uh, in, in, in some in Vietnam, probably still around, and, but in Afghanistan uh, and, uh, and Iraq. And they came back after kind of a losing war, you know? It wasn't like the World War II guys. Yeah. They came back with ticker tape parades and everybody was proud of them. And, and it was kind of the same thing with Vietnam. And sometimes I think when these guys um, 
wonder if they were really in the right place at the right time serving their country. But I guarantee that anybody that took that oath, you know, and signed that check, uh, giving away their life, they uh, served their country and they, um, they deserved to, to, to be thanked. Now, I get, I get a lot of thanks. I run around the country and people thank me because they knew who I am. And I just want to pass along that thanks. To, to all your veterans yeah. in the crowd because they deserve it more than I do. So. We, we have a, a lot that watch, uh, you know, from, from Vietnam to Afghanistan, you know, back and forth. And I can remember one time we were doing a video and we, we'd got this email and this, uh, these people said, hey, we'd like for you to do a little special video for Navy SEAL Team 6 or 9 or 12 or 13. They couldn't tell you what the number was, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, we would uh, just like for them to have it. We'll send it to them. And it was their wives that were doing it, oh, yeah. you know. So we put it together, and at the end of it, Shannon said, you got to sign off. And I said, I don't know where you fellers is at, but I know where you can be when you get home. You can come by here and eat, you know. Uh, I tell people, we, we owe people like you and all the veterans and servicemen and women so much. Uh, freedom come at a cost, you know. And it wasn't, it was, ha it was handed to us in a way for us to protect. And... Um, I'm proud there's people like you out there, Charlie, and all the rest of them that are keeping us safe and old glory flying there behind us. Absolutely. And, you know, Charlie, we, uh, we get so many emails and stuff from servicemen and women that have been through a lot. And they say, I, I can't keep going. I want to give up, you know? And, and I know you've probably got a better answer for them than I do because I tell them, I say, don't give up. I'm counting on you. You know, but what we need to tell them, folks, Charlie. Well, they got they got to keep hope and got to keep faith, and a lot of that, I, I, you know, I mean, my person, personal, uh, in my personal life, I prayed a lot, yeah. and I really believe that there was some kind of master plan. And I may never know what it is, but there's a plan for the challenge that I am facing now, and and, and it's like. As Shoemaker said, you know, this adversity is a horrible thing to waste. If, if you look at the challenge of your life and think there's an opportunity in there somewhere, there's a purpose, there's a reason why I'm going through this and, and, then, and, and, and find that purpose. You know, we got about 22 veterans a day kill themselves. We got a terrible suicide rate with, in our veteran community. And in and, and my, and, and, and my work, uh, and I work with several of these people, uh, they take off the uniform and they don't have a purpose. You know, when you're wearing a uniform, if you want to know your purpose, you know, ask your drill instructor. <laughs> there's, no, there's no doubt. He's going to tell you what your purpose is. And, uh, and you take that uniform off and you're in civilian life and you just, you don't have that direction. You don't have that focus. You don't have that reason to live anymore. And so if you can find yourself a purpose, and it doesn't have to be a wild purpose, you know, te teaching Sunday school, you know, uh, you go, you know, coach a little league team, uh, find something that you can have a passion for that can keep you uh, centered and focused and, uh, uh, and, and, and keep the faith and not just faith in God, but faith in yourself because we're in, we're in the image of God. Yeah. And uh, he, he, he didn't make many mistakes. So. No, I don't think he made any that I'm aware of. Right. I mean, and uh, you know, you have to have, when you have faith, not only in God and yourself, but uh, I want them to have faith too in, in their fellow man, the yes. one beside them, you know. Yeah. I don't think I'd be alive today if it hadn't been for the community of prisoners of war that I was with over yeah. there. Yeah. And, uh, it, and we couldn't see each other for the most part. We couldn't talk to each other. We, uh, our, our, our senior leadership couldn't fire us. They couldn't give us a bonus. They couldn't give it a vacation or a time off. You know, uh, and yet these are the finest leaders I ever saw because they set the example, you know, they, 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 and they said, we're going to get through this. And, uh, and, and, and our motto was <laughs> three words, return with honor. And that was that, that kind of made the day for me as a very junior officer that I was going to go home someday and I was going to be proud to, to what I had done. So it works. You know, Charlie, I've been on a lot of ranches, stay six, seven weeks, and uh, I'd have no radio, batteries wear out, and then I wouldn't have no news at all, you know, and know what happened. And I remember when I got out of a ranch one time, I'd been in there six and a half weeks, and they told me, they said, you know, they... They got Osama bin Laden. I said, I didn't know he was missing, you know. And, uh, but I know y'all, if y'all got news, it was not news that you received from the U.S. so much. 
but it's a lot of fake news, right? Yeah, it, yeah, it was propaganda. Yeah. They tried to brainwash us, you know, like they, they could do it to their own people, uh, but they really had a, a, a tough time cha you know, changing our mind about much of anything. But they used to slide this newspapers under the, the, the prison door. Most of the guys wouldn't even look at them because it was all propaganda. I, was, I, got, I got this newspaper, I guess it must have been uh, probably, it had to be probably late 1969. And, uh, and, and I read it, and the headline was, uh, USSR finally beats the United States in the space race. Well, that was, that was pretty interesting. I, I'd signed up for the astronaut program, and at the time, most astronauts were fighter pilots, so we got, had a lot of guys in that prison camp that, uh, that had orders to NASA. You know, that was just, that, that was the thing we wanted to do. And so I thought, well, that's got to be interesting. And so it read on, not since Sputnik 1, that was their first satellite, has the Soviet Union been farther ahead of the United States in the space race? We have sent a vehicle to the moon, gathered samples, uh, taken pictures, blasted off, returned to Earth, and unlike the Americans, we didn't have to put a man aboard to control our vehicle. <laughs> How many times did you have to read that before it caught a hold? I couldn't believe it. Wait a minute, what does this mean? <laughs> So I'm tapping on the walls and I pass it to the guys next door. And uh, I said, yeah, what do you think of this, guys? And I read that last line and I heard this hooping, hollering from them. It was a great motivator, you know, to think that, that, that we'd done something good. Yeah. You know, Charlie, I, I know that you've done a lot for the Wounded Warriors programs across the United States, probably everywhere. But you know, the, the Lazy T is fixing to start, you know, with a Wounded Warrior hunt. Yeah, we're right there on their ranch right yeah. now, and I really promote what they're doing. Anything we can do for these veterans, I think, particularly the ones that have PTSD. I mean, again, they, they, they need some kind of direction. They need us to know that somebody cares, and Lazy T does that. Yeah. This is a great place to have it. Oh, you yeah. know, there's a lot of peace, a lot of quiet, and a lot of yeah. comfort out here. Yeah, that's for sure. You know, Charlie, what does the Wounded Warrior program mean to you? You know, we got an awful lot of uh, wounded warriors out there, guys that uh, have given their life to the freedom that you and I enjoy. And now they're hurting and uh, th they really need help. And so uh, 22 of them a day are killing themselves, you know, they just, they, they lose hope, they lose faith. And anything that we can do or Lazy T Ranch can do to help them regain, you know, the, the life that they deserve, you know, is, is, is certainly worthwhile. You know, Charlie, Six years is a long time spent in a hole, you know, and uh, you went through a lot. And I know that was painful and hard, but you know, when you, when you come back, it's, a, it's daylight and dark. There's a totally different change that now is happening and it's affecting you. It's affecting your family members. It's affecting people you know, your friends. And it didn't just quit when you got out. No question about that. In fact, some of the biggest problems I think veterans and their families have is when they come home yeah. and they try to, to regain that civilian life that they used to know. Yeah. And it's difficult because they've changed and they've been through the military. You know, they've had all that discipline training and, and they have a focus to the life in the, in the military. And suddenly they come back. Maybe they have a wife and kids and, and they don't know how to act. And, and uh, so it, it really is difficult. Yeah. It's tough. It's tough for these guys that that have given, given their all to something and they come back and have to face rejection. And, uh, and, so, and, and so it's tough. And, and that's where we get back to believing in yourself and believing in your God, believing in your family, knowing that, you know, knowing that these things work out. I mean, it's amazing to me how you go through these struggles in life and if you apply the basic stuff, it all will work out. Sometimes it takes time, but it works. Well, my friend, I've had a lot of visitors in camp, two-legged, four-legged, some that crawled on their belly, but uh, you're a blessing, my friend. You are. I thank you so much. Uh, you have inspired me to even do more, uh, and, uh, and I hope for your viewers out there, too, that uh, you know you, you have to keep faith. You have to keep hope. Uh, you know, we, we honor these folks on Veterans Day, but don't let it be just November 11th. Let it be 365 days a year because we owe them so much. And, uh, Good Lord gives you two hands, one to give, one to receive. Well, let's give. Let's give with our heart, let's give with our prayers, and let's thank these people that are beside us. And, but we want to just tell y'all, God bless you, each and every one. We appreciate you so much. And Charlie, 
Thank you, brother. I tip my hat to you, my friend. I tip my hat to you, my friend. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you.